last, well, two weeks ago, actually, uh, thanks to the ice, and the, or the what we thought was going to be ice. <laughs> Fortunately, we were not in Tyler. They got a lot more than we did. Um, we, were, we were in uh, finishing up chapter 10 and starting chapter 11 of Revelation. Um, we're, we'll begin tonight uh, in verse 3, but just kind of reminding where we're at. We had uh, entered into an interlude of the trumpets, and we saw John, he received a scroll or a book, and he was told to eat that. He took it from a great angel, and, and he was told to eat it, and it would be sweet in his mouth like honey, but it would embitter him. It, in other words, it would not sit well with him uh, once he had eaten it. And so, you know, looking at that and seeing that the message was going to be one, certainly that was going to entail somewhere in it the victory of the saints and thus the, the, the sweet taste, but also God's judgment was going to be something that was not going to be easy to, to hear or to see as John sees it in, in, this, in these visions that he's having in Revelation. Well, as we began chapter, 12, chapter 11, rather, he was told to get up and to measure the temple of God. And we talked about uh, two weeks ago that that temple there is not the one that we're talking about in Jerusalem, the physical temple, but he's talking about the spiritual temple, which is the church. And he was to measure that. He was to take inventory of the church, and he's going to then be able to see later that the church is going to stand. The church is going to remain. The outer courtyard was going to be given to... Uh, the world, and it was going to trample it underfoot, and so there was going to be this this area around where the people of the world are going to be doing the things that uh, they do. And the 42 months, we're going to see that again, three and a half years, we're going to see that number again come up in, in, in our studies tonight, but it is simply a period of time in which uh, there is going to be persecution against Christians, and God is going to then deal with that. Well, in verse 3, we see that he says, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. There it is again. Uh, clothed in sackcloth. And those are, the two, those are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So we see these two witnesses, and you know, the, the, the chapter here tells us exactly at least gives us another emblem or another symbol that we already know the definition for and that it gives us that they are the two lampstands what are lampstands so far in the book of revelation we've seen seven of them <laughs> the very beginning of the book chapter two and three chapters two and three the church right they were representative of the seven churches uh, in, in the area of Asia. And so you have, the, this is called lampstands, so you've got churches. And he also says that this is two olive trees. These messengers are two olive trees. And we can look back to Zechariah chapter 4 and verses 2 through 3, and we can see that being used, that same symbol being used, this, this olive trees, as God's anointed. And, and so certainly we can put that together and see that uh, in some way these two witnesses have something to do with the church. Now, when you're dealing in numbers in the book of Revelation, two is a strengthened number, and it's a reinforced number. And so it may, may mean that we're talking about the church as a whole, not a single congregation, but the church as a whole. You know, one would be a single congregation, but two says more. It says that the, you know, we're probably talking about something greater here, probably the church um, as a whole preaching the gospel. Notice that they stand before the Lord of the earth, and when you stand before something, you are standing before it waiting commands in what you are to do so that you might be able to serve. And that's what we do on this earth as the Lord's church today, and that's what they were in that day and time as well. We stand before the Lord, and we await for the things that he would have us to do, and we do them. We serve him as the Lord of the earth. And, you know, it also may be, some have said, and I think it certainly has some validity, probably, you know, not a lot of difference uh, between the two, but uh, maybe the Word and the church working together. And, you know, the church is not anything if it, without the truth. And, and so those two put together, but like I said, I don't think it would matter much either way whether you were going to look at it as the church as a whole or the church as a whole working with the truth that God has given to us. Well, they are prophesying, these witnesses are, they're preaching 
during the time of persecution, that 1260 days, that 42 months as it says, or that three and a half years, uh, John uses all those different counts for the same thing, uh, but they are, they are preaching during that time that uh, has been told to us that they would be able to do what they want. The world would be doing what they want to uh, the church or there within the temple as we just looked at in verses 1 and 2. And so um, they are prophesying during this time, and that's why they're wearing sackcloth. We see sackcloth in the scriptures. It's, it's, not, a, it's, not, it's not good times, is it? Something's, something's going wrong, right? It usually has to do with death. It also has to do with, you know, uh, when someone is, is emotionally distraught in some particular way. Sometimes it was because of their sin. Sometimes it was because of God's punishment. But, you know, we see people that are in sackcloth in the Bible and we understand that and so they are in sackcloth and so these witnesses while they are prophesying during this time of persecution persecution, it is a time of difficulty it is a time of sadness and they're wearing this sackcloth because we know that Christians are dying right the Christians are dying in this persecution against the church we have martyrs around the altar we know that that is the case and even God says that there's a particular number of people that are going to die and so it is a time of sadness. It is a time of hardship and difficulty in which these witnesses are, these two witnesses, are wearing sackcloth and prophesying during that time. And you know, for us as the church today, whether we were, whether it's good times or whether it's times of persecution, we're still called to be that one thing, right? That witness of Jesus Christ, that preaching you know, to preach the truth of Jesus Christ, in good times and bad. And that, uh, what Paul told Timothy, in season and out of season. I heard no preacher say that's when they want it, when they don't, right? <laughs> no matter what the circumstance, preach the word. And, and, and so he told young Timothy that in Second Timothy chapter 4. And, and so, you know, that, that's always going to be our charge, and we see it with these witnesses. Well, verses 5 and 6 say, And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemy. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. And these have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Well, fire devouring your enemies, waters to blood, no rain upon the earth. Uh, These are actions that we see with Moses and Elijah, right? Uh, We see Moses with uh, the water being turned to to blood. We see Elijah Elijah with the fire devouring the enemies and there's no rain. You remember uh, the king sent messenger of 50 soldiers to get Elijah. And he's sitting on a hill, right? Y'all remember this story? He's sitting up on the hill, and he sends 50 soldiers to get him. And they come, they go, you come down here, he treats him with disrespect, the prophet of God. And, he, and so he calls down fire and burns all 50 of them up. The next commander of 50 comes out with his men, and he talks disrespectful to him. He calls down fire again and burns them up. There's 100 burnt-up people on the ground out there. The next guy comes, and he's kind of nice. <laughs> would like for you to come please <laughs> you know, he went with him but we, we see that idea there and we know that he also prayed that it would not rain it didn't rain uh, and it didn't rain until he prayed for it to rain again um, you know there upon the land during the days of Ahab and, and when it finally rained again it was there at Mount Carmel after he had defeated the, the prophets of Baal you know these are also characters and we're going to talk about the, this on, on Sunday these are uh, the two that we see on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus Christ, right? There on that day on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was, it was Elijah, it was Moses, and it was Jesus, right? And so, you know, it's interesting that we go back and we get the uh, things that, that were done by these men that were also there. So what he's talking about here is that these people, these witnesses, would have the power of Elijah, and Moses. I don't think this is literally talking about fire and no rain. I, I don't read anywhere in the New Testament where Christians were doing that. 
um, you know, causing these kind of calamities to be brought. I think the point that's being made here with this language is like Moses and like Elijah, the Christians, the church, was going to be operating with the power of God, right? Now, there were certainly times when God's power was used in punitive ways uh, through the early church. We see that with Peter, with Ananias and, and, and Sapphira. Uh, we see that with Paul, with Elamus, when he struck him blind for a time. And, and so, you know, it, it, there, there were times when we can see that, but it doesn't seem to be something that seems to be more the exception uh, than the rule. But we're probably talking about here spiritual gifts. You know, these people are going to come at them, but they're not going to succeed. You know, it talks about them being killed in this particular way. What comes out of their mouth, fire is going to come out of their mouth. You know, that when they came up against him, just like when Jesus, when they came up against Jesus and they were having, you know, trying to trap him or they were trying to say something that wasn't true, Jesus always had the answer, right? He always had the question that they couldn't answer or wouldn't answer. And, and, you know, Jesus even made the promise that you don't have to worry when you get brought before kings and before leaders and before people. You don't have to worry about what you're going to say. I'm going to give it to you in that day. And so, you know, this, this early church, they had those abilities. They had the power of God behind them. And, and when someone was going to attack them, they were going to know what to say. And so I think it's more in line with that uh, because that's more in line with what we see in the New Testament. But God's power, though, however, no matter what, will be brought to bear on those who want to harm his messengers. And, and so, you know, we could take it all the way out there that we know that all of this that is going on, all of this persecution that's going to happen over the course of this symbolic three and a half years, it is going to one day be dealt with. And, and God's judgment is going to be brought down upon it. And, and it's going to be something that's not going to be something anybody wants in their life, but yet it's going to be what they have um, stored up for themselves. They stored up wrath for themselves with God. Verse 7 says, And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city which mystically is called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And so these witnesses, they testified, and then they were killed by the beast that came up out of the abyss. We're going to see more of the beast throughout the book, but we're going to see him in the next chapter. He's out of the abyss, simply shows the beast's connection to evil, um, to that which is uh, not from above. Uh, the beast here is probably in connection with the emperor of Rome or the Roman Empire as a whole that's bringing the persecution against uh, the witnesses or the Christians or the church. That word mystically there is kind of an odd word, but it can also be translated symbolically. It's symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, you know, that they're going to be killed in the street of the great city. When we think about this term great city, Sodom and Gomorrah are metaphors for evil, they are metaphors for immorality. They're not necessarily metaphors for a city itself. Um, you know, and then, so we want to take that into account. And the great city may be a metaphor for the world as a whole. I know some people, they get on that, um, where also their Lord was crucified, and, and they immediately go to Jerusalem. And, and, and there, you know, there's some merit to that argument. But I think... And what we see talking about here in the connection to Egypt and to Sodom, I think we're talking about the world as a whole because, folks, Jesus came to the world and he died in the world, so it still fits. You know, he came to the world and the world, you know, it says, John tells us in John chapter 1, he came to his own, his own did not receive him, right? It wasn't just the Jews, he came to mankind and mankind rejected him. Mankind put him on the cross. You know, there's always been that argument throughout history who killed Jesus, the Jews or the Romans? Well, they both did. You really can't get out of it, can you? Gentiles and Jews killed Jesus Christ. The Jews made certain that he went to the cross, and the Gentiles carried it out. So nobody's innocent. I mean, and certainly we all, as children of God, we understand why he's on the cross to begin with, right? Because each, each and every one of our sins put him on that cross. And, and so no one's innocent of the blood of Jesus Christ, except for those 
children that have not committed those sins that put him there. And so, you know, I think when we think about it in that line, we're more, most likely talking about here that the church appears to have been defeated by the powers of the persecutors in this world. So we're, we're talking about what's taking place in this, this physical world. They, they rejected the church. They rejected the witnesses. They killed the witnesses just like they killed Jesus. And isn't that exactly what he said on the night before he died? He said, do not be surprised if the world hates you. <laughs> it hated me first. If the world loves you, then you're there. You're, you're one of their own, right? He said, but if you're one of mine, they're going to hate you. And, and so, you know, the same things that, are, that put Jesus on the cross are the same things that are putting Christians to death in this persecution. And it's, it go, it's as old as, as going all the way back to Cain and Abel, that Cain killed Abel because Abel did what was right and Cain did not. That's always what persecution of the church boils down to. And today in our nation, we, we, we begin to see more and more pressure being exerted against the church. Why? Because we say certain things are right, certain things are wrong, and the world doesn't like it because we do right and they're not. And so nothing has changed. You know, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. I don't think any of this is surprises. And you could probably take Revelation and lay it down on any persecution, and it's probably going to be pretty similar in cause. And God's going to treat pretty much all of it in the same way. He's going to deal with it because we're his children, and he loves us. And so, you know, the church appears to, as the, the witnesses here, they're, they're dead. Their bodies lie in the street of the great city. The whole world has seen the persecution that's been brought. And, you know, when we think about that, the public aspects of Roman persecution against Christians, you know, taking them into a coliseum and putting Christians in, a, in, in a, an arena and letting lines loose to tear them apart. It was a public event. It was something for all the world to see. They're dead in the street. Everybody can walk by and see the Christians being persecuted, and they think they've beat them. And then it says... Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days. There's that number again, three and a half. And not three and a half years, but three and a half days. And will not permit their bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. You know, after the slave rebellion, the Romans they crucified all of the slaves that participated in that, and they crucified them along the, the road that went to Rome, and it was for miles and miles and miles of just crosses. They wanted everybody to see that we beat them. And, and that's really the kind of language you get here, right? Left them in the street so that everybody could see the bodies of the witnesses. This wasn't anything done in secret. This was done openly. This was done so that all could see that the Roman Empire was greater than, in this particular case, the church. It says here in verses 9 and 10 that the world celebrates for a period of time what they perceive as victory over the witnesses. And the reason why they celebrate, and I love the language that John uses. He says they're sending gifts to one another. I mean, this is, this is a happy day. This is a holiday. We've beat them. We, boy, look at what we've done to them. They're rejoicing over the deaths of these children of God. It's, you know, when, when people are tormented when they're told the truth. And we see that in, in Scripture. Jesus tormented the Jewish leaders. You know, we talk about we talked about in the sermon a couple of weeks ago about uh, you know healing on the Sabbath day. Jesus tormented them with his logic in regard to that in the law of Moses. In fact, they walked away from that looking to destroy him. That's, that, that's a sign somebody's tormented by what someone's saying to them. And, and Jesus isn't saying it to torment them. It wasn't done in a way on his part, they're tormented because of who they are, not because of what Jesus did, but because of the person that they've chosen to be. 
When you've chosen to live your life however you want to live it out there in the world, do your own thing with God not even, afford, not, not even in your thought process, and someone tells you that you, that's not right before God, that's going to torment that person, make them mad. And, and it happens all the time. Elijah tormented Jezebel. Jeremiah tormented the Jews. They, they called him crazy and begged him to shut up. Paul tormented the pagans. He tormented the Jews with his teaching. People are tormented with the truth that God has given to this world, always have been. Going all the way back, you know, going from once again, we can go back to Cain, can't we? He was tormented because God wouldn't accept a sacrifice that wasn't the way God said do it. You can back up even further, can't you? A little bit of torment with Eve that she couldn't be like God. Why are you even standing at that tree, Eve? You ever thought about that? Big old huge garden, and you're, you're spending your morning by the tree you're not supposed to eat up? <laughs> you know, there's, there's a process going on in Eve's mind before the devil even speaks. I guess that goes along with what James says, right? That it is the lust within us that provides the temptation. And when we allow that to exist in our life, it will result in sin. And that's exactly what we see with, with Eve in the garden. Well, it says, but after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And after the period of time when the world celebrated them, we see that God demonstrated that the church was still alive, and not only was it alive, but it was strong, and it stood up for all to see causes fear to fall upon those who have been celebrating. And you know, it's fear because they gave everything they had to destroying it. They, 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 they gave every amount of evil that they could bring out of their hearts to destroy it. And there it is still standing. That's scary. That you can't beat them. That you can't destroy them. You know, every time someone thought they had the church defeated, it came back stronger, didn't it? Paul persecuted the church, had them on the run. I'm sure he thought, boy, we're doing good. But the more they ran, the bigger the church got, right? Because they're preaching as they're going. Paul may have thought he was winning, but he came to realize he wasn't. And he came to realize he's on the wrong side too, right? Can't defeat the church. Persecution. You know, there's something about persecution. Hebrews makes it clear to us in Hebrews chapter 12 that God chastens or he uh, punishes disciplines his children. If he doesn't discipline you, then he doesn't love you, right? A, a father that doesn't discipline their child doesn't love their child, doesn't care what their child turns out to be one day. But God does care. And so he disciplines, and sometimes discipline from God is through allowance. That he will allow things to happen. Persecution purifies, folks. It, uh, it cuts away all the half-hearted people that oftentimes just weigh the church down. People that are here for other purposes, people that are sitting in pews for reasons other than Jesus Christ, other than faith and devotion to, to the God of heaven, it cuts them away. Because they're not going to stand. They're not going to get killed. They're not going to go to prison for it because they're not even fully given to it anyway. See? There's a pruning effect. You know, we talked, when we talked about the vine and the branches, there's a pruning in there, pruning away the, the branches that don't bear fruit. Persecution has a purifying effect on the church. Because when you come out of the other end of the persecution, you know who's left? those that have given everything of themselves to it. they stood up. They've been willing to die. They've been willing to be in prison. They've been willing to do whatever. And you're going to come out with a church that isn't having to deal with all the half-hearted, but a church that is dealing only with what they need to do for Jesus Christ in regard to the world. What is left after persecution is true disciples, dedicated to God's work, not distractions, just focused now, this is the discipline of the Lord. 
And we look at that also in, in the nation of Israel. Let me ask you, when, when, when 24,000 died in one day because of immorality, as 1 Corinthians 10 refers back to, uh, when 70,000 died when David did the census, who do you think is being killed? I don't think God is punishing the righteous in that particular case. He's calling out those that aren't his. Uh, we see that in the Old Testament time and time again, especially uh, with um, the children of Israel, especially in the Exodus. How many people that left the land of Egypt above the age of 20 actually walked across that Jordan River that was divided and into the land of promise? Two out of two or three million. What happened to the rest? They all died. They all died in the wilderness because God said, I'm going to wait for the next generation. Maybe they'll, I'm going to call you out. Because their hearts were so against God. He does. And unfortunately, they didn't learn from their parents' problems. Uh, kids were just about as bad as their parents once they got into the land. Well, so when you've done everything you can to destroy someone and they just keep getting back up, that's a little scary, isn't it? You know, I remember the movie Rocky II. And uh, Apollo Creed, is he's, he's upset because people are saying he didn't actually win the fight in Rocky I, right? And he wants to fight Rocky again. And his manager goes, I saw you beat that man like I've never seen a man get beat. Yeah, you get here. And that scares him. Because when you've given your all and it didn't work, you don't have a whole lot left, do you? What can we do now? We've killed them in mass. And they just keep coming. I think, you know, he says that the witnesses here stood up. It's very similar in language to Ezekiel 37. When Ezekiel is taken by God in the Spirit to a valley, and the valley's full of bones, dry, bleached bones are in the valley. There's been a battle there. They, they would fight in the valley, and, and, and you didn't bury bodies back then. And, and so you just left the bodies in the valley from the battle, and, and pretty soon all you just have is a valley full of bones. This, this is something that people understood. They've seen this. He's standing there in this valley full of these bones of this army that had, had obviously been there at one time but had all died. And God says, do you think I can bring those bones back to life? Remember the rattling? He heard rattling. And the bones came back together and flesh appeared on the bones. And, but they were just bodies. And, and then God said, prophesy to them and I bring breath to them, right? Life. And they stood up. And the symbolism was about Israel. It was about the Jews in Babylonian captivity. That, yeah, they were the bones. They, they were in captivity. They were defeated. They were dead. They were lifeless as a nation. But God says, if they'll listen to me, they'll stand up again, right, as a nation. And they would. They'd be returned to the land. And, and so it's the same kind of idea here that, you know, they... They, they, they were killed, they thought they were, had beaten them, but they stood up because God's still there. God restored them. This is He restored the nation of Israel. Verses 12 through 13 says, And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up into heaven in, in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. You now the saints were going to be glorified before their enemies in this particular uh, symbolism here. They were going to see that they were still there. They had not been destroyed. It was God. And it was going to be very visible. And when it talks about a portion of the city, you know, we're talking about either we're talking about the world or we can talk about the, here probably most likely is the persecuting forces. We're talking about the Roman Empire. 
A portion of that empire would suffer. It would be destroyed by God. Probably those areas where the persecution was taking place. I've talked to you before about how that in the Roman Empire, persecution was rarely ever empire-wide. It was It was regional. So probably those regions suffered some kind of calamity or some kind of judgment of God. 7,000 killed by an earthquake, that's just simply a complete number. God's going to kill exactly the people that need to be killed for their actions. It's a complete number that God knows and he will uh, bring it about. You know, don't ever apply anything haphazard to God. No one dies that God didn't mean to die. God is not one to make mistakes. He's not one that doesn't have all the bases covered. If he brings punishment down on a specific group of people, a perfect number here, he brings a a specific amount of punishment on a specific group of people, they're going to be the only ones that see it or feel it or recipients of it. And so that's what we see with that idea there. It says they gave God the glory of heaven. But they're, they're giving God the glory. It's not lasting. It's kind of one of those things where I'm giving it because maybe I want it to, to stop. Nebuchadnezzar did that in Daniel. You know, uh, Daniel uh, told him what the image was, right? He, he translated the, he, or he gave the, the interpretation of the great image. And, and Nebuchadnezzar praised God, the God of Daniel. See, there's not really a faith. It's not his God. But he's just praising, okay, yeah, I can't, I can't explain this. I'm going to praise his God because obviously Daniel's got somebody on his side. But he, he was still a polygamist. <laughs> he still believed in a whole bunch of gods. Because right after Daniel does that, Nebuchadnezzar goes out and builds a big gold image for everybody to go bow down to, right? So he's not a God follower, but for the moment he praised God because he saw a demonstration of God's power. And the Israelites, we, we could list examples with them as well. But we know that in chapter 9 and verse 18, as we've already seen in regard to these people here that gave glory to the God of heaven, there in chapter 9 and verse 18, John says they, they would not repent. So they'll acknowledge God in, you know, in fear at the moment when they're suffering, but the minute the, the hand of God is off of them, they're right back to doing what they were doing before, right? Because they didn't really repent. They didn't really change. And, and that's what we see in, in the book of Judges, right? When God was, had his hand of judgment on the people, they, they would turn to him. But the minute he let off, they'd go back to doing what was right in their own eyes. And, and so, you know, this is not something that is, is terribly hard for us to, to discern here. Well, it then says in verse 14, beginning with verse 14, the second woe is past, and woes are, are talking about the trumpets here, um, or the last, the last three. Behold, the third is woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The kingdom was, pro, was proclaimed as, as standing, standing forever. And that's what we see in the book of Daniel. Uh, we'll go back to that, you know, him interpreting the image that there was the kingdom of heaven was that, that stone that was cut out, right? And it came down, it crushed the image, crushed all those great nations, and, and then it grew and it filled the earth. That was the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, and that was the kingdom of God. In, chapter, in verse 44 of chapter 2 there of Daniel, he says, It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And so that goes along with the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The kingdom of Jesus Christ, folks, will never end. And it will be taken to heaven, and it will continue in eternity. And as long as this earth stands, however long that may be, the Lord's church will exist because the kingdom of God is an everlasting kingdom upon this earth. Verses 16 and 17 says, And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and begun to reign. So we've come back to the 24 elders. We've come back to that throne room scene that we've had since chapter 4. We've come back there. The 24 elders are again worshiping God and thanking him for his great power and his reign over man. 
Then we see, as we finish up the chapter, and the nations were enraged. Oh, I thought they were praising God. <laughs> I told you it wasn't going to last. And your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened. And the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. So the nations persecuted the church because they were enraged and God's wrath was brought down upon them in judgment. And as punishment was meted out to the persecutors, reward was given to the faithful, those who overcome. And heaven was made accessible to men. You know, it mentions the Holy of Holies there. And, and in this particular case, there is no separation of the Holy of Holies anymore, right? When Jesus died, what, what happened to that, that veil of separation there? It, it tore from the top to the bottom, right? It opened up the access. As they, as they understood it symbolically, that was access to God there. That's where he was on the mercy seat. And that was opened up. So no, no one but the high priest ever saw the Ark of the Covenant, right? It was always behind the veil, except at the, when they were carrying it around. No one saw it in that place except the high priest because he's the only one who could enter in. Now everybody has access. Everybody can see. It, it shows an openness to heaven that we have now under the New Testament that they didn't have before. Yeah, in case he did something wrong and died in there, they could pull him out. Because um, no one could go in and get him. And, uh, you know, then we see the wrath of God simply shown in symbols of lightning, thunder, earthquake, and a hailstorm. You know, it, it, it's, it's here, once again, we see this temple of God. And once, as we're talking about the temple, it's not the one in Jerusalem. It is the spiritual temple uh, that we are, are dealing with. Well, moving on to chapter 12. Here in chapter 12, we begin a, the second part of the book of Revelation. It's kind of broken into two halves. And we begin the second part, and it will carry us through chapter 20. And the first part showed us how the persecution comes about for the church. It showed, uh, showed the sins of the persecutors, specifically the Romans, against the church. Uh, it shows sin's corrosiveness in a life and how that's demonstrated. The persecutors were given a chance to repent. It's made clear that they did not. Uh, they were very much like, like Pharaoh. Um, it only hardened their hearts when God spoke. And, and, and when God judged, he, they only became more um, hard against um, doing that which was right. But this section is from the contents of that little scroll that John ate. As we move forward now, we're talking about what's, what was on that scroll. He ate it, now he's testifying about it um, as we enter into this second part. Uh, this is his testimony that he was told that he would have to do. And it's about the spiritual battle of God's judgment upon the enemy, uh, and that's going to be central to this section. Is this, there's this spiritual battle that's going on in, in our world, and we're going to see that uh, demonstrated symbolically. The same characters are in this section that are in the first, but they are simply represented in different ways now. Um, verse 1 says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. It's important that we understand the symbolism of the woman of the child, and of the dragon. That's our three main characters here in, in this particular section. Uh, the woman, uh, as we look at her, there is, a, uh, there is in this symbol a continuity between the old covenant and the new covenant of God. You know, I'm afraid that many view the old covenant and the new covenant as at odds with one another somehow. But that's not the case. And I, and, and I think there's a, a logical reason why some people see it that way. 
Because when we study the New Testament, we look at the book of Hebrews, we look at the book of Galatians or sections of Romans, and we see this, this, this contrast being made between the old law and the new law, and, and it's very adversarial because the old law no longer has any bearing on a relationship with God anymore. It no longer has any ability to justify anyone, to bring anyone closer to God. It has no ability to do that anymore because it has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ, right? The only thing left is the new law. And I think when we continuously study that and we keep making that contrast and we keep seeing how that Paul is trying to tell people, you can't be, doing, you can't be seeking to be justified by the old law. If you have, as he said in Galatians 5, 4, you've fallen from grace. You know, he's making that, and I think we take that into our minds and we think the old law was bad. What well, was only bad when people were trying to live under it when it no longer had any power, when it was no longer God's law? And, and, but, but, in its, but in its proper place, it was perfect. You know, well, I mean, if, if, if we take one as the truth, then it would, impl- it would, it would have both of those in, involved in it. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, ultimately, these two were designed to fit perfectly together as a part of God's eternal plan. And, you know, we teach three distinct ages in the Bible, the patriarchal, the mosaic, and and the Christian, but instead of seeing these as three separate ages, we should probably work harder at seeing them as uh, the unfolding of the total plan of God throughout time. Because that's really what's going on. God's progressively moving man in the direction of where he wants him to get to, get to Christ, right? Paul, Paul tells the Galatians that when Christ came, it was the fullness of time, right? God got it to where he wanted it to be. But that, there was a progressive aspect to Revelation. There was a progressive aspect to the law of God over that 4,000 years that led up to Jesus Christ. And so while we look at those as three separate things, they're, they're actually three aspects of God's plan as it, as it unfolds through time. And I, I think if we see it that way, we, we begin to see the Bible very, very differently. You know, you begin with the scattered family-oriented religion of the patriarchal time, right? Fathers are basically the, the religious heads, right? And, and it all kind of goes from there. But there's Abraham, there's someone over here, there's Melchizedek in Salem, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's very spread out. And, and, but then God brings it to the mosaical time, right? It becomes very central, doesn't it? It's no longer, it's no longer all over the place. It's centralized in, in the law of Moses. as We bring it to the tabernacle, later the temple. Uh, but it all comes there. It all flows in one direction toward one place, toward a high priest, right, of the, of the tribe of, 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 the, of the lineage of Aaron. See how God has has narrowed it now? He's brought it from this very spread out thing to a very narrow thing. And now he's moving in a direction in that. And everything in that narrow aspect of religion under the Mosaic law is a shadow of something that's going to come later spiritually in Jesus Christ. So he's preparing the way. It's the teacher, as Paul said, bringing us to Jesus Christ. And that law of Moses led the people to a religion not of a physical building, a physical temple, a physical Ark of the Covenant, but it led it to a religion of the heart. Jesus said to the woman at the well that where was not going to be as important as what you were, right? God wants true worshipers, those that worship him in spirit and in truth, whether that's in Jerusalem, whether that's in Samaria, it doesn't matter to God. He wants the heart. So he brings it all the way to a heartfelt religion. A religion that's focused on the spiritual and not just a list of laws. And it is a religion where all men are equal in relation to salvation and in relation to their access to God. Everybody has the same opportunity in Christianity as everybody else. No one has to go another route. It's all the same route for every single person that draws breath on this earth from now to the end of time. These laws and their dispensations are not discontinuous as we have sometimes considered them. 
Well, the imagery of giving birth emphasizes the close relationship between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The pregnant woman here would be uh, fleshly Israel. And I'm not talking about the nation itself or the people itself, but just that, that the corporate idea of the fleshly Israel that God has been carrying through uh, to bring about the blessings of the world. So it would be the fleshly Israel, while the woman who flees into the wilderness later in the chapter is the spiritual Israel. We see that contrast there. Law of Moses is very, very uh, fleshly oriented, very physically oriented. The law of Christ is very spiritually oriented, very heart oriented. And so we're going to see that difference in the woman as she changes into the spiritual Israel later in the chapter. But it says, A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. So the woman is, is radiant. The two lights that God placed in the sky. If you go back to Genesis 1, right? The sun and the moon, one to govern the day, one to govern the night. She's radiant with the divine revelation of God. She has a crown with 12 stars, 12 tribes. And there were 12 patriarchs. Um, you know, the 12, I guess if you wanted to bring it even forward to later in the spiritual aspect, the 12 apostles. But Israel had been represented before as a pregnant woman. And Micah chapter 4 and verse 10 says, Writhe and labor to give birth, daughter of Zion, like a woman in childbirth, for now you will go out of the city, dwell in the field, and go uh, to Babylon, and there you will be rescued, and there the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. So like a pregnant woman in labor, the Jews are going to go into Babylonian captivity. It's not going to be pleasant. <laughs> You're not going to enjoy this, this captivity. It's like labor. I've never, I've never talked to a woman that said, I enjoyed labor. <laughs> I just haven't found that woman. And I guess if I do, you're going to you gotta have to lock her up. There's something wrong, right? Um, it's not going to be pleasant. I mean, that's the symbol there of labor. It's not pleasant. You know, Paul uses it in, in Romans chapter 8 as well. Uh, you know, so it, it's not going to be a pleasant thing, and, and that's what uh, Micah's saying. In chapter 5, verse 3, then, he says, Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. So giving birth uh, to her child is returning from captivity. So they go on through the hard part, and they get to return home. But there's a messianic aspect to that prophecy as well, to Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we see this, this birth process uh, being used in regard to the nation of, of Israel. Old Testament Israel was pregnant, as we might say, with messianic hope. And we see that in the gospel accounts that the people were longing for uh, the Messiah. They knew it was time, and they, uh, Luke says that they were in great expectation. Um, Simeon at the temple when Jesus was born, remember, and they brought him to the temple, and he had been longing to see the, the Christ. Uh, they, 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 there was a great deal of expectation, just as it is any time that a, a woman is pregnant and is having a child, there is great expectation as to that child's arrival. This special role that God gave to the Israelite nation to bring forth the one seed that would bless all nations is about to be fulfilled. And Israel is great with child and about to give birth, and we see another character then at this point. Right as the child is ready to be born, it says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. <laughs> That's scary, isn't it? That's some scary language. Uh, you have this... This great red dragon, and it's the Revelation is going to identify this. We don't have to guess at this one. I told you at the very beginning, if 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 John identifies what it is, what the symbol is, that's it. We're going to go with it. In verse nine, he says the serpent that the dragon is the serpent of old, who is called the devil, who deceives the whole world. So we know who the red dragon is. It's the devil. Uh, that's that's just you know we we can just set that one aside. He's red. Probably in context of Revelation, he's probably read from the blood of the martyrs, blood of the prophets, even throughout history. Seven heads shows great intelligence and craftiness. 
2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3 says, But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray the simplicity and the purity of devotion in Christ. The devil's smart. He knew all he needed was to add one word to that statement to Eve, right? He will not surely die. Ten horns demonstrate the fullness of power within his realm, his evil realm. Seven diadems on his head. That's not crowns. It's not the same word. It's crowns, like the crown of victory that we see in regard to Christians. It is um, it's a headdress. Um, the Persians used them. And a diadem was a headdress that, that kings would wear. It's similar, I mean, I guess it would be similar in that sense as to a crown, but not like a crown. But what the symbol is, is that he had, a pow- he had the power to reign over his realm. And certainly he has that. When it says that a tail, his tail, the tail could sweep away a third of the stars from the heavens to the earth, shows that he is a formidable adversary that can bring down men of high position with relative ease. He doesn't have to work at it. He just swaps his tail and they're gone. That's the power of the devil, folks. Now, we need to know who we're facing, don't we? If you think we're facing somebody that's weak, if you're thinking we're facing somebody that doesn't have any power, then you're sorely mistaken and you're probably going to be in trouble. If you're going to fight a war, you better know something about your enemy. Or they'll get the best of you, right? And so, uh, you know, here we're getting an idea that the devil is a powerful being and he has the capability of uh, of causing difficulty uh, upon even the most powerful of people. The devil should be taken seriously. He is our opponent in this life. But what is the dragon doing? This is what's kind of creepy, isn't it? I, I kind of find it creepy. I don't know about y'all. But here's this woman about to give birth, and he's just sitting there waiting to devour the baby the minute it's born. That's kind of creepy, isn't it? But it also shows an intent. Folks, he just looks and waits to devour us. What did Peter say about him? What did, how, how did Peter describe the devil? A lion? Seeking what? Whom he may devour. That's the same idea here, isn't it? He's waiting for this child to be born, and he's wanting to devour it. The imagery is brutal. Well, give you a little heads up on Jesus is the child. And we're going to come to that next week because uh, we're out of time tonight. Uh, I don't want to get too far into that, but the devil has always been seeking uh, to... Sh- destroy the Messiah, the one that God had promised. All the way back there uh, with him right there with Adam and Eve, he made a promise about the one that would crush his head. He would bruise his heel or injure his heel, and he would crush his head. So he's been looking to deal with that throughout time, and and we'll talk about that more uh, next week. Let's conclude with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Today, we thank you for this time that we've had to be together as your children and to study from your holy and divine will, Father. We pray that as we leave this place, that we go out knowing that we face a formidable foe. Father, we pray that you be with us. We pray that we give our lives to you wholly so that you may, you may bring your strength through us to deal with him. Father, we know that while he has power, he has no power in relation to you. And we thank you for that, and we pray that you be with us. Pray that you go with us now and bring us back on the Lord's day. We pray these things in Christ's name.